All right, now I think I'm ready. Well, good morning, First UB Church. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. My name, as he said, is Eli Grove. And if you look in, the, uh, in your uh, sermon notes there, you'll see that my official title is The Youth Guy. Um, that is my official title. We, uh, we were debating amongst what we were going to say for it for a while, whether I was the youth intern or the youth pastor, youth director, youth court, whatever. We'd, we just settled on the youth guy, official title. But I'm happy to join you guys here, and I want to uh, welcome the uh, members of this church who have been uh, coming here for a long time. Uh, I appreciate you braving the uh, chaos of things that have been happening. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I also want to welcome any uh, guests who have joined us here today. Um, for whatever reason, we're also just glad that you're here. And then I'd also like to uh, welcome online visitors. Uh, I was back in the back and saw just a huge number of people that are joining us online today. Uh, we want to say welcome to you guys, and we're excited to get in there. Um, man, it's been a crazy week, hasn't it? I mean, and kind of scary. I mean, with this whole coronavirus thing going on, uh, I think this is a time, I think Pastor Mark nailed it, where we need to be encouraged and we need to be encouraged together. Originally, when I was writing the sermon, I had a slightly different framing for this uh, than what I have now. And I think halfway through the week about God changed that framework, and I am really glad that he did, because I think that this sermon is going to be very pertinent for what is going on in our world here today. This week, there's been a lot of fear going on. There's been some serious struggles whether that's health struggles or just feeling pain and loss and living in darkness. Um, it's been a hard week for a lot of people, including myself, uh, but I believe that God has laid this sermon on my heart, and I am uh, fully believing that God has a specific message that he wants all of us, whether we're here in person today or online to hear. Uh, I'm gonna warn you though, this is gonna be a hard-hitting sermon. Um, not going to pull any punches. It's going to be pretty serious. Uh, but sometimes that's just the way that it needs to be, especially in light of this past week. Uh, before I really jump into the sermon, I want you guys to know the purpose of this sermon, though. Uh, the purpose comes from Hebrews 3.13. Allow me to read it for you. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, today is called today, and I want to encourage all of us not to fall prey into sin's deceitfulness. So with that, let us pray, and we'll jump right in. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for gathering us safely here today. Uh, we thank you for your provisions for us. Thank you for your love. Help us to glorify you with our presence and our attitude today. Lord, be with me as I present this message that you have given me. Let me be clear and speak only what you want me to speak. Lord, be with those who will hear this message, whether it is in person or online. Help them to hear what you want them to hear. Give them understanding. And then, Lord, I ask that you empower us as we go out into this world. Empower us to live out what you have called us to be. Lord, thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So church, I want you to know one thing. It's very important. We have an enemy out there. He's known by many names, Lucifer, the devil, Satan. But whatever name you call him, I want you to know he's real. And he is on a mission. And his mission, to put it bluntly, is to destroy you. Because he hates you. Not only does he hate you, he hates God. And he can't stand you guys, you and God having a relationship together. He wants to destroy that. And he wants you to suffer. And he will use anything that he can. He will discourage us. He will lie to us. He'll do whatever he can to keep us from experiencing what it's like to live 
and God's blessing. And from the very beginning, he was there. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, he was there to tempt Adam and Eve to sin. And guess what? He was successful. Humanity fell, and we lost the perfect relationship that we had with God. And we lost that perfect relationship that we had with each other. And sin entered the world. And Satan, well, he was, he's celebrating for our loss. Yeah, we got him. All right. But then Satan, Satan knew that was coming. Take a look at uh, Genesis 3, 15. This is God talking to Satan. And it says this. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That means that somebody is going to come from the woman one day in the future and defeat Satan. And this is actually the first reference that we get in the Bible of a Messiah, of a coming Savior. And, but Satan, Satan starts to worry. And so Satan thinks, I, I need to stop this. I need to plot somehow and stop this. And throughout history, there is always that, those people that uh, God used to further his plan. And Satan wanted to stop that from happening. There were men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founders of the nation of Israel. And God promised that the Messiah would come through that line. So, of course, Satan hated this nation. He manipulated the Egyptians so that they would enslave the people of Israel, force them to do hard labor, to make them suffer. And for 400 years, that's the way it was. And once again, Satan loved it. But then God called another great man, he called Moses, to lead an exodus. He led the people of Israel out of Egypt, and God gave Moses the law. And from the law, we see a whole bunch of different things. We're not going to get into that right now. But Satan didn't like this either, so he continued his assault against the people of Israel. And thus began the cycle of the judges. This was about a 300-year period where the people of Israel would fall into sin, then they'd cry out to God. God would send a judge to rescue them from their oppressors, and then once the judge died, the people would fall right back in. It was this endless cycle of downward, falling into sin, falling into sin, falling into sin. But eventually, the people of Israel asked for a king. This is not a judge, they asked for a king. And on the second try, they got King David. And God promises that the Messiah that we heard about in Genesis 3, and that was further emphasized by Abraham and by the law, we were promised that that Messiah would come from the kingship and line of David. And so, of course, what does Satan do? Because he wants to hate these people. He tempts the leaders, he tempts the kings, he tempts the people of Israel to fall into sin, of which they do over and over and over and over again. And then God eventually gets tired of this and goes, you guys aren't listening to me and I promise you that something is coming. So then the Babylonians came and they were exiled out of the promised land. And Satan thought, well now the people are gonna be destroyed, no air can come from the woman, and as a bonus, the people I hate, they get to suffer. And Satan was feeling good about himself again. But then God was faithful. He brought his people back to the promised land. And the law was reestablished with a guy named Ezra, and then Jerusalem was reestablished with Nehemiah. And then there's 400 years of quiet. There's silence from God. We don't know what's going on. But Satan, we know that Satan was working diligently. Satan knew that something was coming. So he, instead of trying to lead the people to fall away, Satan tried a new tactic. He began corrupting the religious leaders of the day to get them to be so particular about the law and so particular about the inner workings and everything that they would forget the basis of the law, which is to love God and to love others. But then, after 400 years of silence, a baby is born. Any guesses on who that baby is? And Satan got worried because he realized that the Messiah 
was this baby. This was the one that he was worried about. The Messiah would come and defeat him. So Satan tried to kill this baby as a child. He manipulated Herod to kill all of the babies in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. But Jesus escaped, and he grew up to be a man. He was, and Jesus began to preach about the kingdom of God and about forgiveness of sins, about being the way back to a perfect relationship with God just like it was in the beginning. I mean, this is radical back then, and it's radical now. Jesus did amazing things. He healed people. He caused the blind to see, the lame to walk, and he even offered the forgiveness of sins. Well, Satan couldn't let this happen. Because remember, he, he hates you, and he hates God, and he doesn't want there to be any relationship there. And so Satan had already done his job convincing the religious leaders that Jesus was a threat. But then he enters into one of Jesus' disciples. He enters into Judas and convinces Judas to betray Jesus. And all of this plan culminates in the last hours of Jesus' life. On Friday, the darkest day in all of history, and no, I don't mean Black Friday at Walmart. That's a dark and godless place. But no, we're talking about Good Friday uh, where Jesus was crucified. We see in the crucifixion accounts throughout the Gospels that Jesus, he knew what was coming. And he was anxious about it. So anxious, in fact, that he was sweating like blood. But God, Jesus still did God's will. And Satan's just like, oh yeah, I see you're anxious. I know what's coming. This is going to be good. And then Jesus is betrayed by a close follower. And then Jesus is condemned to die on a cross. And Satan jumps for joy. Woohoo! And then just to rub it in, he has Peter deny Je- Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, a member of the inner three, deny him three times. That's just like rubbing salt in the wound. And Satan just laughs. He's like, oh man, that's too good. The irony is too good. But then he shoots Peter with an arrow of shame. And Peter runs away weeping. And then Jesus is whipped and beaten. Now for those of you who like to cook, that is not what you do to eggs and cookie dough. No, this whipping and beating was serious and brutal. And in fact, sometimes people even died from it. And Satan, he, he's smiling approvingly. He's nodding his head, going, yes, yes, my plan's coming all together. And then Jesus is mocked by the religious leaders and by the soldiers. And I bet that Satan was right up there mocking him too. Ha, huh, you could save others, but you can't save yourself. Then finally, Jesus is led away. He is nailed to the cross and killed. And darkness covered the land. And Satan, once again, he's jumping for joy. His plan won. He's saying, ha, in your face, God. I won. I killed your son. He didn't crush my head, and I sure as heck did more than bite his heel. I won. Ha. And on Friday, it seemed like Satan had won. But that's not the end of the story. But there are many people, there are many people, who live as if that is the end of the story. Sometimes we live without hope. Sometimes we live as if we've been defeated. Sometimes we live in fear. Sometimes we live as if it's Friday. And I say we because, sure, it's easy to think that non-Christians are still living as if it's Friday. But there are plenty of Christians who still do this. I mean, how many of you can relate to the emotions being felt on Friday? I mean, how many have, of you have ever been anxious? I know I have. How many of you have ever felt betrayed or hurt by someone close to you? I know I have. How many of you have ever felt shame in your life? I know I have. How many of you have been mocked? And then, how many of you have been the mocker? That's a little bit more convicting. And then how many of us have simply gone through a dark time in our lives where we're struggling with so many different things? This country right now is going through a hard time. 
The world right now is going through a hard time. And I think that sometimes we do. I mean, I know that I have. So allow me to step away from behind the fence. You guys remember the fence, right? Made an appearance a couple weeks ago. Pastor Mark kicked it in half, scared half of you to death, gave you all a heart attack. You remember that a couple weeks ago? All right. Well, I'm going to step behind it, and I'm going to give you an authentic look at my life, at my Friday. When I grew up, I grew up in a great family. I had a really happy life. I was funny, happy, creative, and man, was I cute. I mean, look at these pictures. Look at that. There you go. Unfortunately, something's changed since then, and I'm no longer that cute. But as a kid, I was really smart, and I got really good grades and did well in school. Don't get me wrong. I was a normal kid. I did not like to go to school, and I took any opportunity I had to enjoy free time, but I was still good at it. And we also, we went to a great church. And my church was awesome growing up, I loved it. My best friends were there, and I built amazing relationships with the people there. It was like a second family to me. I mean, my family helped start this church all the way back in the 70s, and had been there ever since. It, it was a second family, and it was a second home to me. And, e- and even when I went to middle school, that was, it was fun for me. I know middle school is normally a pit of darkness that none of us want to remember or ever experience again, but I actually enjoyed it. I, I joked a lot, had a lot of fun. I mean, some of those jokes came back to cost me later. We'll get to that in a minute. But I didn't care. I was having fun. I was laughing. Here's one thing that we did that was really uh, fun and funny to do. We used to volunteer to take out the trash at the end of the day for my high school. And we turned what should have been about a two-man job into a six-man job. And then we just used it as an excuse to run around with our friends laughing, joking. I mean, we did the trash, but we just kind of joked around. And then, and then in high school, things really started to look up. My grades were excellent. I mean, all my friends said so. All my, my family said so. My grandparents praised me up and down for all of the good grades that I got. And my parents, they just wanted me to do the best that I could. But my best was really good. So I began to put a lot of pressure on myself and put a lot of my identity in my grades. And then in sports, I also started to excel in high school. I played key roles in both the soccer and basketball team. And I enjoyed the praise that came with it. I was the defensive captain of the soccer team by 10th grade. I was a starter by 10th grade for for basketball. And I was really starting to puff my chest out. I was feeling good about myself. And guess what? Oh, man. I even got a girlfriend. Oh, and I thought I was the cool man on campus right there, I'll tell you. I just, it was amazing. I, I, was, I was so mature. I, I had, and I thought, as long as she loves me, I'm okay. This is great. What can go wrong? But what I didn't realize at the time was that I was putting a lot of my identity in what she said about me and what she thought about me. But remember, I have an enemy out there who doesn't want things to go well. He doesn't want me walking around feeling proud and happy. So Satan, Satan hit me hard. On October 5th, 2014, my world seemed to fall apart. On that day, a couple things happened. The first thing that happened was that my girlfriend broke up with me. And not only did my heart break, but my entire identity shattered. If she didn't love me, then who could? If she didn't think I was worth it, then who would? I mean, the person who was closest to me didn't think I was worth caring about. And to be fair, she didn't express these things. She didn't say these things. She handled it well but I was listening to Satan's lies. I was listening to the lies of the enemy. And I felt like a screw up and I felt ashamed. I had been so mature when I got got the girlfriend, but now I guess I realized that I wasn't as mature as I thought. Secondly, on that same day, on October 5th, uh, my family left the church that I was raised at. We had been having struggles at that church for quite some time. And like my dad was in leadership and we were, we were deeply involved at this church and we were, we were hurting. 
So we went to the pastor to see if him and the church leadership would come alongside us and help us discern God's will for our lives. The pastor's response, and I quote, we'll see if we want to meet with you. Pastor Mark, if you ever say that to someone, I'm leaving. <laughs> All right. But I mean, that's a pretty hard slap in the face, right? I mean, we'd been to the church for 45 years. We were deeply involved in the church and to treat us like we weren't valuable at all. And it hurt a lot. I mean, I lost my church family that day. And once again, it was confirmed. I wasn't valuable. I wasn't worth loving. And I wasn't worth being cared for. And because my friends, they, they didn't understand why I left the church, and they hadn't yet experienced heartbreak, they really didn't understand what I was feeling. So I began to feel misunderstood. I felt misunderstood by them, and I felt alone because I was listening to Satan's lies. I separated myself from my friends, from the people that were closer to me, because I thought that they didn't care about me. Now, they cared about me, they were busy with their own lives, but they still cared about me. But I listened to Satan's lies. And I once again con was confirmed that nobody cares for me. How could they? And because of this, because of this pain that I was feeling and the radical shift that had happened to my world and my identity, I was angry. So angry, in fact, that two days later, Two days, October 7th, 2014, I was playing a soccer game, and I was playing very recklessly. I didn't care what happened to me or what happened to my opponent, and I ended up getting a second concussion that day. And it wasn't an accident. It was me being stupid and reckless and angry because of the pain that I had been feeling. That was the second concussion that I had gotten within the last six months. And this had a tremendous ripple effect on my life. The first thing was that I had to deal with a headache every day for two months. It's a lot of pain and a lot of just, not, it's not fun. And it also caused me to sit out the soccer championship that year. I had to watch as my team played in a game that I loved, and then I had to watch as we lost. And I felt responsible. I felt like I had let my team down. And once again, I felt alone. But even worse than that, even worse than all of those things, the concussion changed the chemistry of my brain. And I suddenly lost that happy, cute feeling that I had. And I started to deal with some pretty serious anxiety and depression. And it was a very dark time in my life. I mean, it seemed like Satan had won. I was living in Friday. I felt hopeless, and I actually fell into seasons where I was suicidal. And those were the scariest and the darkest times of my life. It seemed like Friday. But that's Friday. That's not the end of the story. Because on, while on Friday it seems like Satan is winning, on Sunday, it's a different story. So what happened on Sunday? Well, Jesus rose from the dead. We sang about it this morning in our songs. Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered Satan and he conquered the power of sin and death. Showed that they had no hold on him. He rose from the dead and he revealed himself to his disciples. And then he sent them out into the world to proclaim the good news. The good news that Jesus had been raised from the dead. In my own life, God brought me out of my time by living in Friday, by surrounding me with men and mentors in my life that showed me that God loved me, that he was willing to send his son to die for me. And that means that I am worth a whole lot to God. And this changed my life. I mean, I, I still struggle. I still have the emotional scars, and I still feel it. But I know that God is good. And through this process, through all of this time of suffering, 
God drew me closer to him than I could have ever thought possible. And this is my response to that. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, on Friday, we have despair. But on Sunday, we have a living hope. On Friday, we have death. On Sunday, we have a new life. See, on Friday, we have Satan lying and cursing you, wanting the worst for you. But on Sunday, we have a God who loves you and has empowered you to share the gospel with a world that still lives as if it's Friday. It's so important that we understand the power of this and the power of the resurrection. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, one through five. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, what you have received and on which you take your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. That's the gospel right there. That on Friday, it seemed like Satan had won. But on Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. See, Satan Satan thought that he was winning by killing Jesus. Remember, he was up there in your face, God. But in actuality, he was just helping God's plan along. I mean, this is just further proof that God works all things according to his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The darkness of Friday happened And you'd think that that'd be awful, but God makes it, and on Sunday, it's the most beautiful thing ever, the greatest thing in the history of the world. And one day, my friends, one day, it's going to be Sunday again. Sunday's coming, praise the Lord, Sunday's coming. Jesus will return one day. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will restore our bodies. He will restore our relationships, and we will no longer feel the effects of sin. Jesus will rule over us as the king, and we will be kings and queens under the king of kings. I cannot wait, my friends. Oh man, I cannot wait, it's gonna be wonderful. But we're not there yet. Right now, our world suffers because it seems like Friday, but Sunday's coming. Right now, there is pain in our lives because it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Right now, our relationships amongst ourselves are broken because it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Right now, our families are messy because it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming, amen? All right, this is good news. So what are we to do with the good news? Well, share it with others because others Live like it's Friday. And trust me, living as if it's Friday is not very fun. And it's not good for you. Share with others that Sunday has come and Sunday is coming again. Each and every single one of you have a story of how the resurrection of Jesus has impacted you. Share that with others and encourage each other. And that leads us to the second thing I want us to do. All the way back with the purpose of this message is to encourage one another. Build one another up in love because we get confused. We get confused and we think it's Friday. We think that Satan is coming or Satan is winning and we need encouraged. Church, this is so important. I, this, is, this is my challenge for you this week. Real simple, real world application. I want you this week to reach out to someone and encourage them somehow. And then watch what God does with an empowered church body that encourages one another and shares what Christ has done for us. Watch what happens as the world is impacted. This week, whether it is a call, text, letter, note, act of service, a gift, or whatever it is, 
I want you guys to reach out and encourage somebody some way. The third thing that we're called to do is we are called to fight against the lies of Satan. See, Satan uses these lies to separate us. He was whispering in my ear the entire time that it was Friday in my life. And he uses those lies, and then he separates us, and he isolates us because he knows that we are stronger together. Even in a time like now, when like, social distancing is this huge idea, we are still stronger together as a body of believers. That's why meeting here together is so important. But Satan, he uses these weapons, lies and isolation. Those are two of his biggest. We must learn to defend against it. So how do we do it? How do we defend this? How do we defend against the lies of the enemy? Well, number one, you got to know the word. Study the Bible and apply it to your life. Because there is truth in the word of God. Secondly, I want you to surround yourselves with brothers and sisters in Christ who can support you, who can keep you accountable, but who also can speak truth into your lives. I wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for men speaking into my life. And then lastly, I want you guys to know that we have a living hope. Put your hope in Jesus. Don't put it in other things. Don't put your hope on what the government will do or what your own strength can do or whatever else it is. Put your trust in Jesus because he is our rock and he is our salvation. You see, we have hope. We have a hope for a future when Sunday's coming again. Our world needs hope. Our world needs encouragement. Our world needs to know that while it may seem like it's Friday, Sunday's coming. And with Sunday, with Sunday comes power the power to break free from the chains of sin and death. See, we have the power to impact the world because Sunday's coming and has already come. We have the power to impact America. We have the power to impact our country because Sunday has come and Sunday is coming again. See, we have the power to impact Western Pennsylvania, the entire region, because Sunday has come. And we have the power, First UB has the power to impact Newcastle, Pennsylvania because Sunday has come. Church, I want you to stand up if you're able. We're getting ready to close out. We gotta get some energy, we gotta get some blood flowing. Because you see, if, if Satan was still celebrating like it's Friday, if he was still taunting God in your face, I've won, then we can't do anything. There's no point in us gathering together. There is no point in us trying to impact the world. But Jesus has rose from the dead, and he's coming back. Sunday's coming. Church, this is my prayer for us. I urge you to do this. Fight against the lies of Satan. Don't let Satan convince you that it's Friday, because Sunday's coming. Encourage one another, because sometimes it feels like Satan is winning, and we start to begin to believe the lies. Church, we're called to that as long as it's today to encourage one another. So encourage one another because sometimes it seems like it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Love one another well. Show the love of Christ because on Friday, Jesus showed the love of Christ by dying for us. He died for you and he died for me. And on Sunday, he rose again from the dead and defeated death. Church, go out into the world, wherever you live, wherever you work, and wherever you play, and share the good news of the gospel. Live out the gospel. Fight against Satan, because it may seem like it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen. Have a great week. I love you all.